let's get started with Data API Builder. Let's add a Data API over a SQL Server and expose endpoints that are both REST endpoints and GraphQL. My folder has a single file. It's a .env file. It's used as a name value pair for me to be able to set environment variables used by DAB. So over on the right, you can see that I have it opened up in Notepad right now. So I've specified the name of the variable, it's called my connection string. And then to the right of the equal sign is the value that's going to be stored in the environment for me. The second one is not the connection string to my database, but instead communicating to DAB the way that I want it to ex expose the HTTP and HTTPS ports to me when it creates my endpoint. So in this case, for HTTP, it's, it's localhost port 5000, and for HTTPS, it's localhost port 5001. It's that easy. Those are the only two things that I really need to do. But I'll make the point that ASP.NET Core underscore URLs is standard for ASP.NET Core. And that's what Data API Builder is. It's standard. It's not an exotic implementation, but it's the way you would build a Data API if you were building it from scratch. But why? Data API Builder does most of this for you and allows you to remove thousands of lines of code, unit tests, and CI-CD pipeline complexity. Let's just get started, though. In order for DAB to work, the engine needs a configuration file. Now, I have installed right now DAB the CLI. So uh, it is a .NET tool, so it's cross-platform and runs everywhere. And I've got it installed. It's called Microsoft.DataAPIBuilder, and I've installed version 1.1.7. It will help me create and modify the configuration file so that everything is done correctly. Let me show you what I mean. I'll say dab init. The database type has to be provided. So this is a Microsoft SQL. And then the data, the, oh, let's see, connection string. But I'm not going to provide the connection string. Instead, I'm going to tell it to use the environment variable that we specified in our env file. So you can remember it was called my connection string. I'm just going to copy that to make sure I get it perfect. And then the last thing, now that it knows the database type and the database connection string, is to say that the host mode is development. This gives me features like Swagger, and it gives me Banana Cake Pop for GraphQL, and just makes it so that the logging is a little bit more robust. I'll say go, and when I look inside my folder, I have two files. I now have the DAB config. If I open that up in Notepad, we can go over and see, and I'll take away word wrap and just show you that it's in the database section, it specifies the connection string and the database type. Great. And in the runtime section, it shows the rest uh, layout that is going to be slash API. It shows the graph layout that it's going to be slash GraphQL. Shows all the different possibilities of, with authentication, though because I'm running it locally in this demo without any configuration around it, it's not going to have any authentication, so I'll be able to use anonymous. And then, of course, it sets out what the mode is, the hosting mode, and that's development. Great. The one thing I want to draw your attention to is this down at the bottom. Entities is where I expose tables, views, or stored procedures. The CLI allows me to add those, too. Let's go ahead and do them. I have a database. It's a Star Trek database with an actors table. It allows me to um, list all of the actors, and then later we could list the series that they're in and the characters that they play. So let's go ahead and use dab add. So we have dab with the verb add that allows me to add an entity. Now the entity needs an alias. I'm going to call it actor, but it could be anything. And then I'm going to point to what the source is. And so in this case, the source is dbos.actor, right? So this is pointing to the schema.table name. Remember, it could be a view, it could be a store procedure. And then the last thing I'll say here is what the permissions are to access it so that it has default permissions. And I'll say P-E-R-E-M-I-S-I-O-N-S. And this is anonymous. So I didn't spell that right. A-N-N, anonymous. There we go. Anonymous. So anonymous permissions to do what, though? That's what comes after the colon. I'll put star. But we have the options for create, read, update, and delete. All right, great. There's only one in. I'll get that correct before I say go. And now if I reopen in Notepad, the configuration file, you'll see that when we get down to the entities, it's not empty anymore. Actor is there. That's the alias of the table. And then here is the source itself pointing to the table, that dbo.actor, what it's going to look like in GraphQL when I access it. So it's actor, and when there's more than one, it'll be actors. 
it's enabled in REST. Remember, it'll, so in this case, we know that it'll be slash API slash actors. And then what the permissions are. And so I'll just bring your attention that this is an array that I can have many different variations of the permissions. To, so it doesn't have to be all or nothing. All right, so look at the lines here. Pretty complicated set of JSON that really you could write yourself, but the opportunity for error is pretty high. Instead, we just ran two, only two, commands from the CLI. The third one we'll run now is dab start. Dab start will read that env file, then it'll read the dab config file. It will compare against the actual schema in the database, then it'll spin up the endpoints according to whatever I've set up in the hosting environment. So now I can see that I've got HTTPS set up right here. I'll go in. The root of the uh, site here, let me pull it over, it just says healthy and what the version is that it's running. I instead, though, want to go to slash API slash A-C-T-O-R. That allows me to automatically use the REST API against that table that I've set up and be able to access all the data directly. And then I could do other things. I could say question mark. And so you can see there's an ID there's name and there's birth year. So if I only want to know the name, I could say dollar sign select equals name. That allows me to project the data in the format that I want it to be. There are other things I could do as well, and probably the coolest of them is dollar sign filter, which allows me to append a where predicate when it's getting back that data. So there are other ways to get the data where I can say, for example, actor slash, let's say number one, and oh, ID one, sorry, ID one. And that pulls back the record that has the ID of one, the primary key. But then I, with that dollar sign filter, I can create more, more expressive predicates. All right, this is the REST API. What can I do for GraphQL? By the way, I want to show you that Swagger is right here. And so I could interact with the API from here as well, and it's all fully documented. But just like Swagger allows me to interact with the REST API, Banana Cake Pop allows me to interact with everything that is the GraphQL, right? So that's really nice. So it starts with the schema reference. So I can see that I have my actor by PK, so I could pass in just the ID very similar to what we just did. And then I have access to the actors as well. So I can then get all of them and then I can start filtering them in a very similar way. And so if I go down to mutations, I can see what my operations are against it as well. I had all of the methods that I didn't show you, but I had all the methods in REST, but these are the same ones exposed here where I can create, which inserts a brand new record. I can in, I can delete, right? So it deletes an existing record and I can update one as well. And those are all of the mutations that, I that are exposed in GraphQL that were also similarly exposed by uh, different methods in REST. And so now, Let's go into an operation here and just do a quick query. And I think it has defaulted to actor's name. That's beautiful. Let me actually, let's write that from scratch so you can see what it looks like. Q-U-E-R-Y. All right, so I'm creating a query. That means it's not going to mutate the data, not going to make changes to the data. And then I'm going to say A-C-T. And this is where it's going to come up with that um, the type that I was, so I had, I had many tables exposed. I would see all of the tables listed here, views and store procedures. And so I could say actors, and then inside that, I'll ask for specific items. So items in this case, we would equate to a column. And so uh, I have autocomplete that shows I could get ID, name, and birth year. So let's go ahead and get ID, name, and birth year, right? Hide that, bring this over so there's a little bit more space. And when I run that query, that query brings back all of the pieces like you would expect. And then I can go in and just like I did before, I could say, let's take away birth year, run it again. And I can start to project my payload to look like whatever it is I want. One of the neat things that we get from GraphQL is the ability to do nested queries. So if I had sub items that were related, then for example, an actor is, a, is uh, related to a character, a character is related to a series. I can express that in a complex query here. Now remember, all of this all takes place from a single configuration file. This is the configuration file. And even though it seems like there's a lot going on here, it's relatively straightforward. There's no code, there's no framework, there's no download, there's nothing you need except for the container that runs Data API Builder and provide it with this JSON file. And you can then run this on premises, run it in the cloud or anywhere else that makes sense to you. Good luck getting started with Data API Builder.